Iwan Jahotank, Ivak Idum, a Hakulo Imanj, a Mich Tanum. Gracias por venir. Felicidades to all the students um, for for making it to the end of at least one of your uh, many, many journeys, I think, that you will embark on. Um, and gracias, Chris, for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to say a, a few a few words before I read a couple poems to you. Um, uh, one, it's it feels very lucky to be here with you uh, this evening um, to celebrate you. Uh, Lauren was a student in my I had in my class very recently, so um, you know again it's uh, it's I'm here with a lot of emotion and. Um, you know, not only as an instructor, um, but as someone who believes in the power of language, which I am assuming everyone here does, um, especially knowing the number of books and the amount of text you had to read to arrive here. Um, I'm just trusting that we're in this together. Um, in Mojave, we believe that language is an energy, a verb, a happening. It has the power to change a moment, to incite a movement, to resist or to confirm. It is prophetic in many ways. What we can say, we are never far from enacting, for better or worse. Language is one of the body's many technologies, a sensuality too. To speak is to touch an other, to carry yourself to them. I've never believed more in the power of language than I do today, its power to de deliver violence or joy. Poetry, for example, is one way I have learned to love myself best. As a Mojave and an Atham, from a reservation that was once a military fort and eventually a boarding school, language, the English language in particular, has been the way I and my community have been injured most violently. It is a lucky thing to have learned this paradox. Language at once can be violent at once can be tender. I've also never believed more in the gift of teaching. Teaching, in my experience, is another type of learning. What my students offer me, in wonder, in inquiry, in vulnerability, is unlike anything I've found in other spaces. Language is my diminishment. My student Meg Kelsey said this during one of our graduate classes this semester. The title of that class was Body is Sublime, Grief and Ecstasy in Brown and Other Bodies. Meg is a powerful poet and artist, and Meg is also deaf. Our discussions in that course intended to trouble the power structures inherent in many of our lexicons, power structures we often ignore or defend or vehemently deny, power structures we are all complicit in. Part of what Meg was referring to, part of what we pressed on in that class, was the power of language to lessen and diminish a person or to let that person be whole. Because we are an institution still learning the lexicons and language necessary to address gender, sexuality, race, disability, and ableness, violence, intersectionality, among many other necessary inquiries, it is urgent that we acknowledge the power of language and, and question our lexicons and practices of conversation. When we write, when we speak, when we read, whose bodies do we erase or diminish? Who do we recognize as being a full body with the capacity for not only pain and victimhood, but also futurity, meaning love and pleasure, anger and complexity and innovation? What we do, our art, is not surgery, is not a rocket ship to the moon, is not a world peace agreement. It is not those things, yet every one of these things is leaped from the imagination. They are only possible through, language, through the language in which they are conceived and exercised. Without the humanities, without your attention to story, to words, to bodies, including their violences and tendernesses, including the bodies these stories and words carry, technology is only a hammer without its hand. A tool without the body's desire and imagination is no tool at all. 
One of the myriad things Meg meant when she said, language is my diminishment, is that if we require her to demand recognition, a recognition of presence and visibility we take for granted, we are stating that hers is not a whole body, not a body like ours. What we mean is hers is not the body in power. If she has to ask to be accommodated, it is an indication of a culture built upon a failure of imagination, the failure of our imaginations. As you move out into your next future, be it at 7 p.m. tonight for dinner, or the coffee shop tomorrow, or your classroom in August, inquire of yourself, who does my lexicon diminish or erase? Who does my lexicon make visible and celebrate? Who does my lexicon grant the power of futurity and wholeness? How will I use my lexicon to resist, to innovate, to make a single moment meaningful? And I'm going to read just a couple poems for you. Um, my students and, and my colleagues, and Lauren will know this, we, we talk a lot about risk. Um, you know, in the work we do, one of the questions we ask often is, you know, what am I risking in this work? And it's a tough question to ask um, because, you know, sometimes the answers aren't always, um, you know, right in front of us. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I feel like I'm, I'm always risking when I come to the page is that I'm, I'm risking the autonomy of, of pleasure. I'm risking the autonomy of tenderness. Um, and that feels very necessary to me in this day. American arithmetic. Native Americans make up less than 1% of the population of America, 0.8% of 100%. Oh, mine efficient country. I do not remember the days before America. I do not remember the days when we were all here. Police kill Native Americans more than any other race. Race is a funny word. Race implies someone will win, implies I have as good a chance of winning as who wins the race that isn't a race. Native Americans make up 1.9% of all police killings higher than any race, and we exist as 0.8% of all Americans. Sometimes race means run. I'm not good at math. Can you blame me? I've had an American education. But, you know, ASU is a much better education. <laughs> we are Americans and we are less than 1% of Americans. We do a better job of dying by police than we do existing. When we are dying, who should we call? The police or our senator? Please, someone, call my mother. At the National Museum of the American Indian, 68% of the collection is from the United States. I am doing my best to not become a museum of myself. I am doing my best to breathe in and out. I am begging, let me be lonely but not invisible. But in an American room of 100 or so people, I am Native American. Less than one, less than whole, I am less than myself, only a fraction of a body. Let's say I am only a hand. And when I slip it beneath the shirt of my lover, I disappear completely. And that's always been an interesting statistic for me to consider. If I'm less than 1%, how much of me is ever present? Um, Another thing we talk about in, in my, my classes with my students is um, there's a quote from a poet named Solmaz Sharif. She's an Iranian poet. And uh, one of the phrases is, it matters what you call a thing. And that's something I really believe in is the prophecy of language. And I think that's where we have the most power. You know, if, if we can say it, if we can build it, it, it can happen. Um, and so this is an example of, of me saying um, I have anxiety really bad and, I, and something that it's something I struggle with. And so I thought, if I truly believe in the power of language, what if I call this thing something else? What if I make it something new? How much more possible can I be um, from the desire field? 
I don't call it sleep anymore. I'll risk losing something new instead, like you lost your rose and moon, shook it loose. But sometimes when I get my horns in a thing, a wonder, a grief, or a line of her, it is a sticky and ruined fruit to unfasten from, despite my trembling. Let me call my anxiety desire then. Let me call it a garden. Maybe this is what Lorca meant when he said, verde, que te quiero verde. Because when the shade of night comes, I am a field of it, of any worry ready to flower in my chest. My mind in the dark is una bestia, unfocused, hot, if not yoked to exhaustion beneath the hip and plow of my lover, then I am another night wandering the desire filled, bewildered in its low green glow, belling the meadow between midnight and morning. Insomnia is like spring that way, surprising and many petaled, the kick and leap of gold grasshoppers at my brow. I am struck in the witched hours of want. I want her green life, her inside me in a green hour I can't stop. Green vein in her throat, green wing in my mouth, green thorn in my eye. I want her like a river goes bending, green, moving, green, moving. Fast as that, this is how it happens. Soy una sonambula. And even though you said today you felt better, and it is so late in this poem, is it okay to be clear, to say I don't feel good, to ask you to tell me a story about the sweet grass you planted and tell it again or again until I can smell its sweet smoke leave this thrashed field and be smooth? And then I'll end on this. This is the happiest poem I have. Um, now, again, I, it, it feels good to be here with you and, and to see, I feel like every time I'm in a class with, you know, with writers or people who are, are willing to, to be vulnerable, vulnerable in the face of writing, and, and you know, Lauren, of course, was, was one of those people on that journey with us this semester. Um, but we really have a gift in the ways we have been able to come to language and to realize um, you know, that language can make the simplest thing extraordinary. And suddenly to realize the, the, the true miracle of language, that I can say a thing and it can find you on the other side of the page or on the other side of, of what it is that I've said. Um, and so this is a poem that, that to me feels just like a celebration of language, of being able to make what is simple and every day somehow miraculous. I watch her eat the apple. And this was, I just, there, I was at a conference and there were apples everywhere. Um, There's this abundance of them. And I just sat and watched somebody eat an apple and I just thought, what an incredible thing to watch somebody eat an apple. Um, what a lucky, lucky moment. I watch her eat the apple. She twirls it in her left hand, a small red merry-go-round. According to the white, ap white oval sticker, she holds apple number 4016. I've read in some book or other of 4,015 fruit she held before this one, each equally dizzied by the heat in the tips of her fingers. She twists the stem, pulls it like the pen of a grenade, and I just know somewhere someone is sitting alone on a porch, bruised, opened up to their wet white ribs, riddled by her teeth, lucky. With her right hand, she lifts the sticker from the skin. Now the apple is more naked than any apple has been since two bodies first touched the leaves of ache in the garden. Maybe her apple is Macintosh. Maybe red delicious. I only know it is the color of something I dreamed, some thing I gave to her after being away for 10,000 nights. The apple pulses like a red bird in her hand. She is setting the red bird free, but the red bird will not go. So she pulls it to her face as if to tell it a secret. She bites, cleaving away a red wing. The red bird sings. Yes, she bites the apple, and there is music, a branch breaking, a ship 
undone by the shore, a knife making love to a wound, the sweet scrape of a match lighting the lamp of her mouth. This blue world has never needed a woman to eat an apple so badly, to destroy an apple, to make the apple bone, and she does it. I watch her eat the apple, carve it to the core and set it wobbling on the table. A broken bell I beg to wrap my red skin around until there is no apple. There is only this woman who is a city of apples. There is only me licking the juice from the streets of her palm. If there is a god of fruit or things devoured and this is all it takes to be beautiful, then God, please, let her eat another apple tomorrow. <laughs> Gracias, felicidades, congratulations.